as well. Must say, Mr. Speaker. Now, I believe there's been agreement amongst the parties for a moment of silence on the loss of the players in the Humboldt crash. Merci beaucoup. Oral questions. Question oral. The, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. David is a 28-year-old husband and father and the owner of a small business that employs three people. He and his wife both work more than full-time, but he's told me that they can never afford a home. David says he feels like a failure and like he's letting his family down. Like most Canadians, David doesn't come from money or a rich family. Apart from winning the lottery, there is literally no chance that he will ever be able to afford a home. My question for the Prime Minister is, what would he like to say to David? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've heard from Canadians across the country, like David and others, uh, who are facing challenges with the rising costs of living, with the uh, crushing pressures of the housing market, and that's why uh, we're focused on supporting them. We made a promise to David and to Canadians like him across the country that we'd have their backs through the difficult two years of the pandemic and beyond, and that's exactly what we continue to do. Uh, in tomorrow's budget, you will see significant investments in housing, uh, in supports for families, uh, in a way that continues to grow our economy uh, for families from coast to coast to coast for years to come. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. The problem is the Liberal housing programs are helping no one. Young people like David are not interested in programs like sharing the equity of their home with the government. In fact, it would appear that not many people across the country are interested. There's only been nine applications to the shared equity housing program. It's, it's a bit of an embarrassment, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the Liberals don't seem to have a solution to the housing crisis. Can the Prime Minister admit that actually he doesn't have a clue as to what to do with this housing crisis? And as long as he is Prime Minister, young people in Canada are just out of luck. Mm. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. In 2017, we moved forward with the first national housing strategy that brought forward significant investments and programs to support families. At the same time, we recognize there is no one solution to the housing challenge. Uh, we need to keep mo moving forward with a broad array, uh, array of supports that will help different families facing different challenges across the country. And that is exactly what we've continually done, uh, innovating, putting forward support making sure that with investments that support families and ease their way into the housing market, uh, we're going to be able to respond to this challenge. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, the more money they spend, the more the cost of everything goes up. Yeah. There's no doubt that tomorrow we, we will see an irresponsible, high-tax, high-spend budget from the NDP Liberal Coalition, one that promises to drive up inflation. The more money these guys spend, the more everything becomes more expensive. Canadians are worse off today than they were six years ago. The Prime Minister is ignoring calls for a responsible budget. He's ignoring calls for tax relief for Canadians. The only people he seems to be listening to are the NDP. And the only reason he's doing it is so that he can hold power. Yep. Isn't that the truth? That's right. <laughs> Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Speaker, the leader of the Conservative opposition spent the first two questions sell it, telling us we needed to do more to support Canadians, and then spent this question saying we're doing far too much for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, we've made a commitment to have Canadians back while remaining fiscally responsible. That's exactly what we've done over these past six years. That's what we're going to continue to do with tomorrow's budget and with our investments in Canadians over the coming years. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Megantique lerab Mr. Speaker, in terms of public finance, this Prime Minister has less credibility than others. In 2015, Canadians were able to become house owners, and but inflation from this Prime Minister has made access to housing impossible. Things cost twice as much, and interest rates will continue to rise. Can the Prime Minister admit that his promises are empty words and help Canadians from the youngest to the oldest and give them a break. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, as we've done for years, we're investing to support Canadian families, to support young people who want to find, buy their first home and to help low revenue families in terms of rent. We're going to continue to have Canadians' backs while remaining fiscally responsible. This is the choice we have made as a government, but the Conservatives like to say that we're doing too much for Canadians, but we know that we're going to continue to there to support them, and that's exactly what we're going to do for them and for economic growth. The Honourable Member for Megantique lerable What path will the Prime Minister take tomorrow? The Honourable Member for Pontiac, who says she's fiscally responsible, revealed what is currently being said in the Liberal backbench. What I sense from my colleagues is that we're going to have to be more judicious in our spending choices. We'll have to do more with the dollar than we're doing now. That's a hard criticism of that fiscal management. Tomorrow, will the Prime Minister be smart and responsible, or will he turn his back on his own Liberal caucus and Canadians by implementing the NDP's agenda? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, two years ago, we heard the same thing from the Conservatives. They were criticizing us to have invested too much to support families and small businesses and to support workers throughout this pandemic. And that's what we did. And this allowed our economy to come roaring back. And it allowed us to recover all the jobs that were lost. And we're going to continue to be there to support Canadian families. The Conservatives want us to do less for families, but we are going to continue to have their backs to support them and to be fiscally responsible. The Honourable Member for Ballet Chambly. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of the Environment said a contradiction. He said that they were waiting for federal environmental evaluations with respect to Bay du Nord. And then he said it was provincial jurisdiction, a Liberal that mentions provincial jurisdiction. Well, that's interesting. This, because there was no incoherence or clarity, it doesn't really give them much credibility in terms of GHGs. Can the Prime Minister now announce that he's going to say no to the Bay du Nord project? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for almost seven years now, we were elected to show that economic growth and protecting the environment and the fight against climate change go hand in hand. And that's exactly what we've done for years. Now, we have the most ambitious and concrete plan that Canada has had in terms of reducing GHGs. And at the same time, we're investing concretely to help families and workers to get through this transformation period for energy. We're always going to be here to show that we understand that the economy and the environment go hand in hand. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. We're discovering that the Bay du Nord project may be approved or is on the point of being approved. That's a surprise to no, no one. One billion barrels. The IPCC has been very critical with respect to governments and their responsibility. Although they didn't name our government, they know that they're talking about Canada. There is a serious incoherence between the proposed reduction plan by this government and this Bay du Nord project. Mr. Speaker, does the PM think that the IPC is wrong? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, 
for several years now. We have made science-based decisions and the best recommendations from experts across Canada and worldwide to put forth the most ambitious and concrete projects we've had in our country to protect the environment and to fight climate change and to create economic growth and prepare for the economy of the future. We're in the midst of transforming our economy to reduce our GHG emissions, and it will take time to get there, but we are going to be here with great determination that the Canadians require of, of us. Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The IPCC report makes it absolutely clear that we are failing in doing enough to stop the climate crisis. Instead of presenting a real plan to fight the climate crisis, the government is doubling down on more fossil fuel subsidies with a carbon capture tax credit. Why does the government continue to insist on subsidizing wealthy oil and gas companies instead of investing in clean energy and workers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know what's at stake in the fight against climate change. It's why we're stepping up our climate emission by committing to more than $100 billion to climate action. We're ensuring we reduce methane emissions by 75% by 2030 and transitioning to a net zero electricity grid by 2035. We're also doubling our commitment to $5.3 billion to help developing countries fight climate change and, perfect and protect biodiversity. And we will continue delivering ambitious and achievable climate action that protects our communities and builds a healthy the future for everyone. Right London, the, deputy, the, Burnaby said. the Honourable Member for Burnaby South, IPPCC's report is clear. We didn't take enough action to tackle the climate crisis. And instead of presenting a real plan, the government continues to increase oil and gas subsidies with a carbon catch capture tax credit. Why is the government continue to increase wage subsidies rather than investing in workers and green energy. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, our emissions plan is the one is the most comprehensive in the world. It'll give us a strong economy for all Canadians. We have been credible about all the contributions that every sector must do to make our plan work and Clean Prosperity and other scientists have all approved our plan. We promised an ambitious plan and a doable one to create possibilities for Canadians, and that's exactly what our emissions reduction plan will do. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow we'll witness this Liberal government's very first NDP budget. The picture won't be pretty. Canadians should expect a tax and spend budget that will make inflation even worse than it is today. Gobs and gobs of unfocused spending, deficits as far as the eye can see, and of course higher taxes. So can the Prime Minister tell us whether his budget will deliver a plan to fight the skyrocketing cost of living in Canada? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as is with every Liberal budget, our focus is on supporting Canadians and uh, growing the economy for years to come. That's exactly what we're doing by making responsible investments in a uh, fiscally responsible framework. That's what Canadians expect and that's what we'll be delivering in investments in housing, investments to fight climate change and prepare for the clean economy, uh, investments uh, in Indigenous communities, making sure that we are growing the economy in a ways that helps the middle class and everyone working hard to join it. That is our focus, Mr. Speaker. I just, I just want to say we made it to 11 questions without a whole lot of heckling. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, Mr. Speaker, every Liberal budget is a tax and spend budget. More Liberal tax and spend policies mean even worse inflation. Wages haven't kept up with the cost of living, while the cost of groceries and gas and housing and pretty well everything else has become unaffordable. Millions of middle-class families have fallen behind. Remember when the Prime Minister promised to stand up for the middle class and those wanting to join it? What happened to that promise? Yeah. Oh. Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, global inflation caused first by this pandemic and now by Vladimir Putin's illegal war on Ukraine is putting pressure on families, from food prices to gas. Just like we did through the pandemic, we'll continue to have Canadians' backs and make life more affordable for families, seniors and the middle class and those working hard to join it. We increased uh, the Canada Child Benefit to match the cost of living. Conservatives voted against that. We move forward with $10 a day child care for families within the next five years. Conservatives voted against it. GIS for vulnerable seniors, more support for students, more affordable housing. Conservatives continued. Now, just because we made it through 11 without a whole lot of heckling didn't mean we had to restart. Uh, the the Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Aitchemin Levy. Mr. Speaker, Canadians can't take it anymore. They're suffocating. The cost of living and inflation are at the highest levels in 30 years. Everything is more expensive and salaries aren't keeping up. The government doesn't realize the distress of thousands of Canadians. Media reports also tell of unbearable situations. Tough choices are being made between paying for groceries or your rent. Can the Prime Minister commit to tabling a bud budget, budget that will tackle inflation to allow Canadians to take a breather. The, the Right Honourable Prime Minister, it has been a priority for many years to make life more affordable for Canadians. Extreme weather events, supply chain issues, the war in Ukraine and the pandemic have all affected the cost of prices of food. We have launched the local infrastructure project that will help nonprofit organizations to increase food security. We'll continue to be there to invest in families responsibly. We'll be there for Canadians, unlike the austerity proposed by the Conservatives. Central Okanagan, Samilkameen Nicola. In the last election, the Prime Minister cut and pasted from the Conservative housing plan and promised Canadians that, and I quote, Houses shouldn't sit empty when so many Canadians are trying to buy a home. So, we are going to ban foreign ownership in Canada for the next two years. Yet he's done nothing of the sort. Why does this Prime Minister habitually promise things he has no intention on delivering on, Mr. Speaker? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I will point out that the Conservative Party's marquee promise uh, around housing was to give tax breaks to wealthy landlords to help them sell their buildings, things that wouldn't have helped uh, anything, any uh, ordinary Canadians working hard to afford their homes. That's why we move forward with the 2017 National Housing Strategy. That's why uh, in tomorrow's budget we will be making significant investments in housing, in supporting Canadians in the range of solutions that are necessary. There is no one solution, Mr. Speaker. There are only meaningful efforts across the board by this government to make sure that things get better for Canadians. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Aitchemin Levy. Mr. Speaker, the cost of real estate has skyrocketed. The average cost of a home under the Liberals has doubled from 413,000 to 816,000. This is shocking. Young people can't realize their dream of owning their first home. And in the rental market, even slums are renting at high prices. What does the government intend to do in its budget to give young people hope because they are a victim of his lack of action? The Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, the cost of housing is a true source of concern for middle-class Canadians, particularly young people. This is why we've helped more than two million families to purchase a home, and we're investing 60, 72 rather million in our national housing strategy. We supported the construction and renovation of more than 420,000 housing units, and we're here intend to increase uh, the number of housing units units considerably, and we still have work to do, and we're going to continue to focus on investments in families, in communities, and in the economy as needed. Thank you. Central Okanagan, Samil Nicola. 
He promises, he spends, he fails, he spins, and then he repeats, Mr. Speaker. This Prime Minister just can't help himself, let alone help millennials, millennials who are stuck in their parents' basements. Even last week, he was in my home province of British Columbia promising more action on housing affordability. When millennials see housing prices double since 2015, when he was elected Prime Minister, they see through his empty words. Millennials are jaded. They're cynical about him, about his promises. Is there going to, when is he going to admit his housing failures, or is he just going to blame others for his failures? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the pressures faced, uh, faced by Canadians in the housing market, particularly young Canadians, uh, which is why, uh, contrary to what the Conservatives are recommending, we're going to continue to invest in them and support them. Because over the past years, with our investments, we've helped over 2 million families get the housing they need. We've committed $72 billion for the National Housing Strategy. We supported the creation and repair of over 440,000 homes. We've invested to increase rental units by over 71,000, uh, but we recognize there's much more to do. And with tomorrow's budget, that's what we're going to do. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Champly. Mr. Speaker, IPCC, the International Group of Experts on Climate, the highest authority in this area. Well, I don't know what the Prime Minister has done to undermine their expertise, but if we listen to the announcement this afternoon, the Baie du Nord project is a global catastrophe. Tell me, against this backdrop, is there someone thinks for real that Canada will achieve its reduction targets with this plan? The government should never be at the beck and call of oil companies. Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, in recent years we presented concrete plans and ambitious ones to fight climate change, and we are delivering on this necessary transformation in terms of reducing emissions. We are going to continue to do the work to bring Canadians to a carbon neutral future. This, we're going to do this by investing and forging partnerships and remaining committed to following the science. And that is how we're going to succeed and protect Canada and our planet and create good jobs for the middle class and for future generations. The Honourable Member for Rupontigny. Last year, the International Energy Agency warned that a ban on new oil and gas development was necessary to stop global warming. But the science mentioned by the Prime Minister spoke. The IPCC spoke. It confirms that there's no more room for fossil fuel expansion, period. We have three years to cap emissions. Three years, Mr. Speaker. So we must reject the Baie du Nord project and its 30-year extraction of billions of barrels of oil. How can the Prime Minister say that he's for science if he approves Baie du Nord? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our plan for reducing emissions is one of the most exhaustive in the world. It is going to offer pure air and a strong economy to Canadians. We have been credible in terms of all the contributions the sectors must bring to fight climate change, and we're going to respect these targets with all the decisions and choices we're going to make in the years to come. I'm not the only one to say that our plan is credible and concrete. The Climate Committee of Canada, Clean Prosperity and other scientists have all approved our plan. We're going to continue to be there for Canadians in the fight against climate change. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, Mr. Speaker, all Canadians, Canadian families are affected by rising food, gas and housing prices. That's what we call inflation. But this Liberal government has made prices right in Canada. Why? Because this government has never controlled spending and worse yet, it is increasing taxes like it did last Friday. We had to wait for the budget to be tabled. And this is the first time we're going to have an NDP Liberal budget. Can the Prime Minister say he will be responsible, control spending, and not raise taxes? Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, inflation is a global inflation caused by the pandemic and by the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin. And it puts pressure on families across our country. 
we have been fighting the cost, rising cost of food and oil, and that is why we continue to have Canadians' backs. As we've already done, we're going to continue to make families and seniors and middle-class lives more affordable with things like we've already done. We're going to enhance the CCB. We're going to create $10 a day child care across the country. We're going to increase the GIS for the most vulnerable seniors. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, what I hope and what I feel, as my colleagues do as well, is that we're going to have to be more judicious in our spending choices. We have to do more with the dollar than what we do now. I am not the one, as a Conservative member, who said that it's our Liberal colleague from Pontenac that stated this on behalf of their colleagues. So, once again, tomorrow we have an opportunity for a new budget, a new NDP Liberal budget. Can the Prime Minister listen to what their colleague is saying when she says we have to be responsible and not continue doing what we've been doing for seven years, spending irresponsibly and increasing taxes. Even the Liberals are asking for this. this the Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, every year around the same time, we're listening to the same refrain. They Conservatives want to be have austerity. We have to cut in services and programs for Canadians. But fortunately for Canadians, we're not listening to the Conservative policies as they want to spend cut spending for Canadians. We are acting responsibly and wisely to create economic, economic growth, to bounce back from this pandemic and to help seniors and students and to help families. That's exactly what we're doing and what we have been doing for seven years, and we're going to continue to do so. We're going to be responsible and invest in families. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow is Canada's first ever NDP Liberal government, and the stakes have never been higher for my generation. Many of us can't afford a house. We can't afford groceries. We can't afford to fill our tanks with gas. And we know dental care is not going to solve it. Pharma care is not going to solve it. Child care is not going to solve it. Spending more money is not going to solve it, Mr. Speaker. Educated, fully employed young people can't get ahead in this country. So what's going to be in this budget tomorrow to give us some hope for the future, Mr. Yeah. Speaker? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, to hear the Conservatives say that uh, child care is not part of the solution for families is to see, once again, the Conservatives just don't get it. The fact of the matter is that the uh, thousands of dollars that families are going to be saving uh, with the cut in half of child care costs as of this very year will make a huge difference in their ability to buy groceries and gas as prices continue to rise. And our true choice to invest in families, to invest in students, to invest in support for Canadians, as opposed uh, to cutting services for them like the Conservatives want, is the right one for all of Canada. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray Cold Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like most parents, they want to leave a legacy for their children. I know so many parents who save and go without luxuries so they can pass something on to their kids. But under this government, Runaway inflation is making saving nearly impossible, and out-of-control spending is saddling our children, like my seven-month-old son, Owen, with debt they'll never be able to pay off. Will the Prime Minister stop mortgaging our children's future to fund his promises to the NDP? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since 2015, we've been investing in families with a Canada Child Benefit uh, that Conservatives voted against that gives hundreds of dollars a month tax-free to families that need it. Uh, we move forward with a child care agreement right across the country that not only will cut child care costs in half this year, but reduce to $10 a day within five years right across the country. These are initiatives that not only support support families now, but create economic growth that will leave our kids and our kids' kids better off for generations to come. Order. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, the IPCC report gave us a clearer warning. 
If we don't act now, the hope of a livable future is burning up. But the Liberals keep throwing fuel on the fire. Instead of focusing on investments in green energy and good jobs, they continue to hand out billions to big oil. Instead of capping oil and gas emissions, they plan on increasing oil and gas production. How does the Prime Minister expect Canada to meet its climate targets when he is paying big oil to pollute? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as the member opposite knows, we are committed to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies in the next two years. We've already phased out eight tax breaks for the sector. This week, we presented our emissions reduction plan that goes line by line to cut emissions and will inform our approach to cap and cut emissions from oil and gas that need to be part of the solution as we reach net zero by 2050. We are taking real action to fight climate change by committing over $100 billion to climate action and making sure the polluting is no longer free anywhere across the country, despite the objections of Conservative politicians. We will continue our work. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Well, last week the Prime Minister gave a huge thumbs up to increased oil production, and this week the IPCC said the planet is now at the tipping point of irreversible climate catastrophe. And the UN Secretary General has called out government leaders. Order. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, last week the Prime Minister gave thumbs up to a massive increase in oil production, and this week the IPCC tells us the planet is now at the tipping point of irreversible climate catastrophe. And the UN Secretary General called out government leaders who are, quote, saying one thing on the environment and doing another. And he says they are, quote, lying, and the results will be catastrophic. We're talking about the future of our children here. This Prime Minister has clearly been carbon captured. Why does he continue to rubber stamp big oil projects? while the planet is on fire. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians know what's at stake in the fight against climate change, which is why we're stepping up our climate ambition by committing more than $100 billion to climate action, ensuring that we reduce methane emissions by 70% between now and 2030, and by transitioning to a net zero emitting electricity grid by 2035. We're also doubling our commitment to $5.3 billion to help developing countries fight climate change and and protect biodiversity, we will continue delivering ambitious and achievable climate action that protects our communities and builds healthy futures for everyone. The Honourable Member for Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have been clear. They want good jobs, a healthy environment, and a strong economy. Last week, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change unveiled the Emissions Reduction Plan outlining the next steps towards achieving these priorities for all. Can the Minister of Environment and Climate Change tell us what are the objectives of this plan? Well, I'm going to guess it's the Prime Minister who's going to answer that. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member for Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam, for his question and his incredibly strong hard work on the pile. Canadians know what's at stake in the fight against climate change, and the emissions reduction plan we tabled last week is one of the most comprehensive in the world. The Emissions Reduction Plan invests $9.2 billion into credible climate solution and lays out sector by sector how we meet our goals. Our plan is about delivering clean air and a strong economy for Canadians. And I'd like to thank leaders from the environment, business, public and private sectors for their support. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, rural Canadians can't afford this spend EP Liberal government. They've killed rural jobs in oil and gas, forestry, mining and agriculture. They've caused record inflation and piled on red tape that crushes small businesses. Western rural municipalities want them to stop the carbon tax hike on fuel that makes everything more expensive. They say no. Conservatives ask the NDP Liberals to scrap new taxes and rein in spending. They say no. no. Will the NDP Liberals get out of the way and stop making things worse for rural Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, our investments in rural Canada continue uh, as we move forward on broadband investments, on cell coverage investments, uh, and investments to support our farmers and our energy industries and our uh, fisheries and forestry industries. We know that rural Canadians work incredibly hard uh, at, uh, in a very important time for our economy and our future, and we will be there to continue to support them every step of the way. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. So that's a really long no. The NDP Liberals, just like the Prime Minister just did, always talk about big spending and top-down government programs, but the results are record prices for fruit, fertilizer, fuel and food, for heating and housing. Rural Canadians pay a rural tax of over 1500 bucks just to travel for medical care. None of those are luxuries. Farmers can't change the distance to their fields or to the store. Rural jobs aren't in office towers walking distance from home. Why do the NDP Liberals always either ignore or hurt rural Canadians with their tax spend and fail agenda? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, over the past number of years, we've continued to be there for rural Canadians, whether it's investments in agriculture, whether it's support uh, for small communities, uh, whether it's reaching out uh, to resource communities uh, to prepare for the future. We will continue to stand by Canadians from coast to coast to coast, and we won't simply fall back on slogans uh, and easy solutions like the Conservatives do. We will work hand in hand with rural Canadians and indeed people from coast to coast to coast to build the kind of future we know everyone deserves to offer their kids and their grandkids. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, housing in the GTA is scarce and expensive, and it's getting worse. Home prices have doubled under this government, and Canada still has the fewest homes per capita of any G7 country. This government will muse about their so-called plans to fund affordable housing just to have their new NDP dance partners at every level of government uh, oppose actual development. When will the Prime Minister tell Canadians why he thinks only those with the trust to fund deserve to the dream of home ownership. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the previous Conservative government for 10 years withdrew the federal government's engagement in housing and therefore, uh, unfortunately, we had to pick up an awful lot of stack, a slack since 2015. With the national housing strategy in 2017... Order. Let's, let's, hear, let's hear the answers, please. The Honourable Prime Minister, you can start again. Uh, Mr. Speaker, after 10 years of Conservatives choosing to underinvest in housing, uh, for the past seven years, we've been making up the slack by investing in communities, by investing in a national housing strategy worth around $72 billion now, and continuing to move forward to support people uh, in the GTA and indeed across the country be able to afford their homes, afford their rents, uh, and move forward in a response way. That's what we've been focused on. That's what we will continue to do, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Speaker, more spending doesn't equal results. Exactly. It equals more inflation, and Canadians can't afford a home. Canada's fiscal house is on fire, and the NDP are pushing the Liberals to throw $1.68 gasoline on it. Canadians know one thing about the upcoming budget. It's going to be expensive. So will the Prime Minister have the courage to tell Canadians that he couldn't get the trust of the majority of voters, so he decided to spend taxpayer money and buy his majority oh, here. Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, the member opposite wants to talk about results. Our investments in housing across this country have helped over two million, uh, two million families get the housing they need, supported the creation and repair of over 440,000 homes. I've invested to increase rental units by over 71,000. But yes, Mr. Speaker, we know there's more to do, which is why we won't be listening to Conservative politicians when they tell us to cut supports to Canadians. And instead, we're going to continue to invest responsibly in families to help them build a better future for themselves and future generations. The Honourable Member for Jean-Cain. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois and the Prime Minister don't agree on health transfers. That's one thing. But now, health care workers are speaking to us and we must listen. On Monday, professionals from across the healthcare spectrum met doctors, nurses, psychologists, physiotherapists, 
support staff, all of them are calling for a long-term increase in health transfers with no strings attached because the federal government is not doing enough. All of them agree that piecemeal funding with conditions doesn't work. Most of all, they want the government to listen. So will the government meet with healthcare workers at a public summit on healthcare funding? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, throughout the pandemic, we have worked with the provinces and territories to protect Canadians from COVID-19, and we invested more than $63 billion more in health care because of the pandemic, because we knew that we had to be there for Canadians, but also to support health care workers. So we're going to continue to be there to invest and to work with provinces and territories, and we're going to be there to deliver results that Canadians expect for our health care system across the country. The Honourable Member from Mulcan. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister cannot have the right to reject the opinion and expertise of our health care workers. They are the ones who keep our health care system going. Today, these men and women are calling for a long-term increase in federal funding that is recurrent and without conditions. They want to be able to plan the future of our health care system, and so they need foreseeability. Why won't the minister pledge right now to meet with these health care workers at a public summit? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for two years, we celebrated our heroes of the health care system who have done extraordinary work to support Canadians throughout this pandemic. But we also listened to them and we heard them, whether it be with more investment and especially, Mr. Speaker, it need, we need better results, better supports for our health care workers. That is why we are going to be there and we have promised to be there in order to increase the health care transfers, but we're going to do it in partnership with the provinces and territories to ensure that the, these results are delivered for citizens and for workers. Interlake Eastman. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Russian dictator Vladimir Putin has the blood of Ukrainians on his hands as his soldiers have raped, tortured and slaughtered innocent civilians. These atrocities are war crimes and crimes against humanity. Putin must be stopped and Canada must do more to help. It's reported that President Zelensky directly asked Canada for harpoon anti-ship missiles, but this Prime Minister said no. So will the Prime Minister commit to send harpoon missiles to Ukraine today, not weeks from now, but today, and help save Odessa? Here, here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the news of the senseless murders and systemic sexual violence towards innocent civilians in Bucha and elsewhere across Ukraine is egregious and appalling. We've seen throughout this conflict the targeting of civilian and, uh, civilians and civilian infrastructure by Russia across Ukraine. We do believe that these crimes uh, are war crimes and crimes against humanity. We are pursuing multiple international legal avenues in support of Ukraine, including at the International Criminal Court. And yes, we will continue to offer military aid to the Ukrainian forces. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that this Prime Minister has not met his commitment to Canadians for 7,500 doctors, nurses and nurse practitioners. Oddly enough, at Health Committee, we have heard from the College of Family Physicians of Canada that we need at least three to 4,000 family doctors alone. Also, the Canadian Nursing Association states we're short about 60,000 nurses. 60,000! Uh, right. In this budget, will the spend P Liberal Prime Minister admit he's failing Canadians from Spring Hill to Tidnish to, to Stewiak, all of Nova Scotia, and all Canadians, and commit to sustainable and predictable health care funding? Yeah. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, when we see, Mr. Speaker, that Conservatives are both asking us to invest more in supporting Canadians, while at the same time decrying that we're investing anything to support Canadians. Uh, over the past two years, we invested an extra 63 billion dollars uh, in health care supports for Canadians and we've committed to working in partnership with province and territories to deliver both more investments and more results for Canadians when it comes to health care. We look forward to working with provinces and territories as partners as we deliver the support for Canadians that they very much need and deserve. 
the Honourable Member for Foothills. The Liberals have failed on trade compensation for dairy, wine, spirits and beer producers and PEI potato farmers. They continue to fail Canadian agriculture with a punishing carbon tax. Well, let's review. The Liberals said the carbon tax would reduce emissions. False. Emissions have gone up. The Liberals said that the carbon tax would be revenue neutral. Shocking. False. We know that farmers will get pennies on the dollar for what they pay in a carbon tax. In a time of a global food crisis, we should be unleashing Canadian agriculture, not go. sabotaging it. So tomorrow's budget, will the Liberals admit this is a failure in the carbon tax? Will they do the right thing? Will they exempt Canadian agriculture from the farm-killing carbon tax? Yes or no? Yeah. <clears throat> the right honour. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let us be clear about the facts. The price on pollution means more money in Canadians' pockets and less pollution in our air. Even the member for New Brunswick Southwest acknowledged that our plan helps lower income households the most. And we know that eight out of ten Canadians get more money back when they spend. I spent significant time speaking uh, with our agriculture workers and farmers, and they have said that they know the world is changing. They need support to fight climate change and the price on pollution is part of moving forward hand in hand with farmers to build a better future for their kids for their grandkids and all of Canada the honorable member for Saint-Michel mr. speaker in the current information age intern internet makes information available to everyone globally immediately. However, the power balances are unequal. For years, hundreds of local news producers have had to close their doors in Canada because of a lack of income, whereas the web giants literally have a, have a monopoly on who survives and who doesn't. What is our government doing to counter this? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for saint Anal saint michel for this question and for her hard work. With the, the bill that we tabled, we are increasing journalistic independence across Canada. The web giants will have to compensate journalists when they use their content while ensuring a transparent approach that protects uh, freedom of expression. That is essential for journalism, for all communities who count on their local media, and it's essential for our democracy as well. Thank you. Over Dufferin Caledon. Trying to get trendy and virtue signaling and involving yourself in political demagoguery doesn't achieve anything. Now, who said that? Former Liberal MP Dan McTagg at Environment Committee yesterday talking about attacks on the oil and gas sector. Damn. That statement applies nicely to the Prime Minister's emission reductions plan. Energy costs, up. Greenhouse gas emissions, up. Uh, Canadian pocketbooks, uh, empty. Virtue signaling doesn't work. Will the Prime Minister finally admit all he's given Canadians is economic pain with no environmental gain? Yeah. Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, we see the Conservatives take no uh, seriousness uh, in regards to the uh, climate change challenges. Uh, we have again and again seen from these Conservatives that they want to make pollution free again. Uh, they want to uh, continue to ignore the impacts today of the impacts of climate change and ignore impacts on future generations, whereas we know that investing in reducing emissions, investing in transforming our economy to be more innovative and clean is the best way to ensure a strong future from all Canadians from coast to coast to coast. For Dufferin Caledon. I think the Prime Minister and I have a different definition of what investing is. This is what their investments have done. $60 billion since 2016 to reduce carbon emissions. And guess what? They've gone up. Now he's talking about $100 billion investments. So if it went up 27 megatons with a $60 billion spend, how much will emissions go up with this alleged $100 billion spend? Why doesn't the Prime Minister just admit it's not working, it's not fixing the environment and it's costing Canadians billions. Once again, Mr. Speaker, the Conservative politicians prove that math and science is simply not their strong suits. Uh, we will continue to follow the science. We will continue to prepare Canadians and communities and workers for the transformation of our economy, for the reduction. Are you ready to 
continue? The Right Honorable Prime Minister. Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the reality is when it comes to following the science around climate change, when it comes uh, to doing the difficult and responsible things to prepare for the future, Conservatives choose to bury their heads in the sand still today in 2022. Mr. Speaker, Canadians from coast to coast to coast know we need to step up in our fight against climate change. We need to make investments to prepare the future, and that's exactly what we are doing. Honourable Member for Battleford's Lloydminster. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This Liberal government excluded other levels of government during the collective bargaining process with the National Police Federation. The agreement reached is much higher than anticipated, and despite their exclusion, rural communities have been left to foot the majority of the bill. Rural municipalities who face greater financial constraints have been desperately asking this government for assistance with the one-time uh, back pay costs. So, Mr. Speaker, Will rural communities find relief in tomorrow's budget, or will the Prime Minister continue to stick it to rural Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this collective agreement allowed RCMP members to receive their first pay increase since 2016 and ensured that their salaries were in line with other police services across Canada. Municipalities and provinces were at the table since the very beginning of these negotiations, and I can assure the member that increased costs are shared by the contract jurisdictions and the federal government, just like all policing costs in regions served by the RCMP. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank once again the members of the RCMP for their continued service to communities right across the country. The Honourable Member for London North Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The unspeakable and senseless acts of violence perpetrated by the Putin regime, including those recently uncovered in Bucha, demand accountability. This is why the RCMP will be deploying a specialized unit of investigators to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Mr. Speaker, would the Prime Minister please elaborate on the RCMP's intentions to assist the investigation of war crimes committed in Ukraine? Thank you very much. Okay. Wait, what's the what's the hold on the Parliamentary Secretary should not be asking asking questions. So I know the Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Member for Oh, that's the Red Boss. No, 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 there's no question, and therefore there's no answer. Okay, so we're going to move on to the, we're going to move on to the next one. The honourable member for Edmonton, Greensboro. It has been almost three years since the final report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls was released. The families who have lost loved ones are still waiting for all the calls to justice to be implemented. Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people are invaluable parts of their community but they continue to face higher rates of violence. They deserve so much better. There is no time to lose to immediately implement all the calls to justice to help stop the violence and save lives. So my question is to the minister, what are you waiting for? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government has been committed to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, to uh, healing for the families, for uh, justice for the victims of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls uh, assassinations. These are things that we will continue uh, to work on together. Uh, in tomorrow's budget, I can assure uh, the member opposite that our investments uh, continue to be there for Indigenous communities to move forward on the path of reconciliation, to promote healing and justice, uh, and to ensure that Canada continues uh, to share in the right path of reconciliation. And the Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister's answer so far today suggests that no one has briefed him on Monday's report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We have a chance to not be criminally irresponsible in this place and do what is required, and the IPCC says it's this. Now or never, emissions must drop by in half by 2030, and our use of fossil fuels must peak and begin to go down rapidly starting in three years in 2025. Does the Prime Minister understand IPCC science? 
The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what we put forward last week was the most ambitious and concrete emissions reduction plan that Canada has ever seen. Uh, we know for many, many years, uh, politicians of all different stripes have put forward aspirational targets of reducing massively our emissions, uh, but no government until last week was able to put forward a concrete plan that actually demonstrates how we're going to reduce our emissions by 40 percent from 20, 2005 levels uh, in the next eight years. This is something that we have committed to, that we have demonstrated is doable, is concrete, and will deliver on the expectations of Canadians that they see a, a positive future for kids and grandkids while protecting the planet and creating good careers. And that's all the time for our question period today. Point of order. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet, Temiskwata, Les Basques. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There have been consultations between the parties, and I think you will find consent for the following motion. That this House recognize that we must promote the inclusion of diversity within our institutions. That